reading is from Malachi 4, verses 1 to 6. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the aggrant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of, the, of hosts, so that it will leave them ne neither root nor branch, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves, calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of the hosts, remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordin din ordinances, ordinances that I command him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will return the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. The Gospel reading is from Luke 1, verses 5 to 17. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron, and her, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God living blamelessly according to, their, according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as, a, as priest before God during his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before them to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you. Thank you. All right, I am about to ask you to do probably the worst thing you can do while listening to a sermon, especially if you did not arrive this morning sufficiently caffeinated. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. We're going to do a guided meditation. So go ahead and close them if you'd like to participate. Welcome to the inside of your head. Do me a favor and take a few deep breaths, just in and out. All right, I'm going to ask you now to picture yourself sitting in an auditorium. Now, whether or not you would ever find yourself in a place like that is beside the point. The house lights are on, you're in a cushy seat, you're staring at a stage covered by a thick curtain, and people around you might be chatting away or trying to find their seats, you know, maybe some more clumsily than others. Ushers are wandering up and down the aisles. And then there's that moment, you know, the house lights darken, the footlights come on, all the chatter around you suddenly hushes and everyone is waiting for the curtain to rise. In the orchestra pit, the musicians are poised at the ready. 
The conductor taps their, ba their baton and prepares to start the music. Everyone is waiting in anticipation of what is about to happen. You can open your eyes. So if you participated, the feeling you might have experienced, that feeling of anticipation of something about to happen is, as I explained to the children, what Advent is all about. It's the hushed anticipation inside a movie theater before the movie begins. You paid your ticket because you, know, you knew that, hey, this is something I want to see. You heard the show was good, that's why you came out, but there was really no way for you to know for sure until you saw it for yourself. So there you were. When it comes to a feeling of anticipation, God granted a similar vision to what we just did to the prophet Isaiah. Now, when you hear the word prophet, um, a couple of ideas or words might come to mind for you. A soothsayer, um, a haggard looking individual, maybe a little eccentric, kind of weird clothes. Maybe they can tell the future, you know, and they might talk in a really loud voice, you know, kind of grating. Isaiah, the prophet, was not one of those people. He was what I'm going to call a corporate prophet. So he was a part of the king's court, which meant that he was as entrenched in the government as any other official, religious or otherwise. Now, that's not to say that his prophecies only were meant to toe the party line. You could easily see how corrupt something like that must be. Not at all, in fact. If the king was waiting for good news from this prophet, he never got it. All that Isaiah had to offer was bad news. That's all that God gave him as a message. Now, depending on who you were at the time of the prophecy's announcement, that a savior was on their way, the Messiah. You know, it might have been good or bad news. You would think that it would be nothing but good news. A king is coming to rule, and that rule will be holy, it will be sacred, all sin will be abolished, all those that have been our enemies will be wiped away, and we will be free to worship God as we wish. That sounds like really good news, except that if you aren't leading your life correctly, if you are leading a life of injustice, the coming of a Messiah might not be such great news for you. Because what was coming was not a moment of grace or joy, maybe for some. It was a moment of judgment. And I think you heard that in Malachi. Now, the Christian calendar starts on the first day of Advent, so Happy New Year, sort of. It's not a calendar in the strictest sense, this Christian calendar, but it does measure the passing of time. And it tries to tell a narrative about Scripture all of the Sundays that we gather together. This calendar is less about time and it's more about a journey. So we kick off this year by taking just a few weeks before the glory of Christmas to reflect upon the impact of the Savior's birth into this world and what it means for us. So in a way, it's like an introduction to a classic story. A baby would be born into a world that would prove abundantly hostile to him, but needed him more than it knew. In this, there is nothing unique about the story of Jesus' birth. Every child born is born into a world that is hostile to it. That's why we have parents. Without parents and guardians, we would all be vulnerable as children. It's such a crucial role to have someone not just to instruct us as children, but to protect us because the world is not kind to children. And yet every newborn carries the promise of a better world with them. That idea of being born into a world hostile to children and yet having this hope as well is an idea that every single person who has chosen to become or did not choose to become a parent has had to contend with since people began appearing on this planet. 
It either keeps people from having babies or it affirms their choice to do so. A lot of our young people, as a matter of fact, after surveying the landscape of our current world, have made in increasing numbers the decision not to have children. And frankly, I can't blame them. There is a lot happening right now that might make someone averse to bringing new life into the world. And yet, despite all the evil in the world, people keep having babies, you know? The hopes and fears of all our years are met in the form of a little child laying in a manger. Now, those of us who parent hope against hope that the children under our care will not only enjoy a better world than the one that we currently live in, but might in fact one day contribute to making the world a better place for future generations. I know that's the hope I have for my children. And so Jesus was a child of two worlds in this way, the present world and the one to come. Like his cousin John, who would be born to the high priest Zechariah and Mary's cousin Elizabeth, Jesus often spoke of something called the kingdom of God, as did his cousin, who preached about it first. Now, the way these guys talked about it, the kingdom of God was not just some far off future. It was something in the here and now, evident every time someone did something that looked like what life in the kingdom would be like. Anytime somebody might put another's success and future before their own advantage was evidence that the kingdom of God was at hand because left to themselves, I would say most people would choose to walk a selfish path. It's just human nature to put ourselves before others. Now the story of Jesus is a story of how God is active in the world and is coming to vindicate it. It was of absolute importance to the earliest Christians that their lives would be ordered and spent like people who believe this through and through. They literally believed in those days, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen any day now. We need to be ready. They literally believed that the end was on its way. If you weren't ready for it, you were gonna miss it, or worse, you would meet the judgment that was spoken of. So as you make your own preparations for Christmas, it might do you some good to remember the reason for the season and to consider how you might honor what Jesus hoped to teach us about the coming of the kingdom in the way that you choose to celebrate Christmas. Now, you might have recalled, if you were putting together a Thanksgiving dinner, you might have recalled the business of the last several weeks as you prepared to offer what might have been perhaps the most significant Thanksgiving of a generation. There's a lot of differences in politics in families all across that spectrum. And I, I, I don't know about you, but there might have been an enormous amount of tension present at the table. And that could have been focused on to our detriment or ignored possibly to our detriment, but at least it enabled peace. I hope your Thanksgiving was peaceful. I hope it was enjoyable. And heck, maybe it was just spent alone, you know, an, uh, a day off, probably much needed. All we are about to undertake that began on Thanksgiving and just seems to keep going until we reach Christmas might suit our earthly preferences and pressures. I mean, Christmas, there's a lot of pressure, right? If only just gifts, right? Are we going to deliver? I mean, I don't know about you, but like my parents gave up the enterprise altogether and they're just like, just make a list, you know? Make a list. We're tired of trying to figure it out. But I must ask, are all those preparations that you're going to engage in and have already begun to engage in, have you given thought to maybe how they're going to offer hope, hope in God, hope that God is in the world and is somehow all going to turn all this darkness into light. Think about that as you make those preparations. Is it conveying hope? The word of God is only good to those who receive it. 
Your ability to receive it depends on a number of factors. But the primary one, I dare say, is an ability to listen. Now, the exercise I had you do at the beginning of the sermon, you know, that was a listening exercise. If you permitted yourself the luxury of focusing on the words and allowed your mind to drift into the vision, you might have experienced genuine feelings of anticipation. But the feeling of openness, the willingness to try, of tuning yourself to receive an experience, good or bad, you paid your ticket, you didn't know if the show was good, you'd heard good things about it, but you're there because you're hoping that it's good. Without knowing is essential. That, that experience is essential for learning about God. Some might even call it faith. Now, during Advent, we prepare ourselves to celebrate Christ's birth, but we also look forward to his impending return. And that return, as I mentioned, is a period of judgment. And as the folks in our Advent Bible study learned, it's also a reckoning. We talked about how when a Roman emperor would visit a city in the old times, um, at the time of Jesus and John the Baptist, a messenger would be sent ahead of him to prepare the way. And that preparation was something else. It wasn't because of any love for the emperor. I'm sure there were people who did love the, that monarch. But that monarch was not coming with just himself. He was bringing court officials, an army, a host, as it were. They didn't want, they didn't want any trouble, you know? So what would they do? Well, there'd be this flurry of activity in anticipation of the emperor's coming. They wanted to put their best foot forward. Everyone took out their trash and swept the streets. Everything needed to be perfect so that when the emperor arrived, there would be no cause for alarm. And John the Baptist, who we focus on today, was that messenger. Now when the angel Gabriel appeared to the high priest Zechariah as he entered the Holy of Holies in the temple, this elderly cleric must have reached a point in his life where his prayers concerning a child and heir, which was important in those days, had been put behind him a long time ago, decades perhaps. Both he and his wife Elizabeth had longed for a child and eagerly expected one early in their marriage. What married couple that wants kids doesn't have that expectation? You try and you try and one day you receive the blessing. You expect it. But after many years of prayer, undoubtedly, these folks found the idea of having a child in their advanced years to be an equally painful and humorous thought. For the angel to have said, your prayers have been heard, and that a son would be born to them must have triggered a cascade of emotions. I mean, how to even feel about something like that? This old couple had long accepted that it just wasn't going to happen for them. I remember praying for a child when my wife and I began married life together. After three years of trying, we knew something wasn't right. It hadn't happened for us. And we elected to try IVF, in vitro fertilization, to help us realize our dream of having a family. Now, part of the process involves testing. And you can only imagine my shock when I learned that I could not have children in the normal way across every measure the test accounted for. Prayer is always a good idea. I believe in the power of prayer, and you should too. But I realize that my asking God for a child, well, that wouldn't have been an answer to prayer, receiving a child. It would have been a miracle, a miracle. You see, God is not some genie in a bottle that grants wishes. There's no right way to ask God for something to make it materialize. Prayer is about communing with God, asking God to join us in our lives, and attuning ourselves to God's will. Because God does expect things from us. Most often, God responds to our prayers by just being present, letting us know that God is there, promising to be with us through difficult times. And that was how God saw Bonnie and I 
through this difficult period, through the entire IVF process, which can be very traumatic, especially for the mother. And really, to thank God for the blessing of our firstborn, and as a wish for my son, we named him Abraham, which means father of multitudes. It's important to remember as we prepare the way for God that all of this holiday cheer exists because faithful people choose to take this time each year to remember an event that changed the world forever and to engage with it as fresh each time. Isn't that interesting how we do that? Every year it comes and every year we engage with it as a fresh time. We have our traditions, of course. And not everyone celebrates for the same reason. But there is something about the weeks leading to Christmas that are full of anticipation. Even unbelievers have trouble putting their finger on it, you know, on how this time of the year is different. Is it all the Christmas decorations going up? Is it the smell of all that wonderful food, ham, turkey, fresh gingerbread, you know? Uh, the desire to know what's in those wrapped gifts under the tree. Oh, you know, I hope it's good. Maybe it's all the advertising. I mean, they just start with it earlier and earlier each year. <laughs> or can it be that inside each of us is a still small voice that whispers through the ages with a promise of better times to come that meets us where we are and touches our deepest hopes. Siblings in Christ, hope is coming, and it is already here. Praise be to God, and amen.